super fast internet to remote rural areas or Danger, Will Robinson. Hi, this is Scott Ott with Bill Whittle Now. And Bill, uh, this episode, as you and I both know, is not possible without the contributions from the members of BillWhittle.com. And we express our gratitude to those folks. Thank you so much. Um, the uh, story today actually comes to us from, of all people, Elon Musk, who seems to be doing everything of value in the, in the world today. <laughs> yeah. He's not the only one, but uh, he certainly gets a lot of attention for it. Uh, his plan to uh, set a constellation of Starlink satellites around uh, the Earth um, right now has reached some 650 or so satellites. They're averaging one launch a month on a SpaceX rocket with roughly 60 satellites on those rockets. The FCC has given uh, Elon Musk and his organization permission to put some 12,000 in a constellation around around uh, the globe so that gigabit internet speeds of 100 milliseconds latency or less for you geeks in the audience are possible for anybody who wants it, even in very remote areas. Uh, Bill, the other side of this story is that some people are concerned that this vast array of satellites not only interferes with ground-based uh, astronomical observations, but also creates danger in the case of collisions, uh, spawning debris fields that can not only jeopardize other satellites like GPS or military satellites, but even astronauts on the ISS. Uh, you think of all things space, and for those who haven't seen it yet, Bill, Bill's series on Apollo 11, what we saw, is visible at BillWhittle.com. Uh, Bill, what do you make of this, this conflict between the advance of science and technology to benefit people in remote areas versus the risk? Well, it's like everything else. I'm glad you put it that way. It's a risk-reward equation. Um, the ability, the, 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 the internet is, is essentially for any kind of a technological society, it's, it's just simply irreplaceable. You just have to have it. That's all there is to it. And that's getting more and more dependent every single day and will continue to be. So there's your reward. Uh, the risks come in two forms. One of them is, um, for the sake of a better word, annoying. The other one is catastrophic. The annoying one is what you mentioned about um, interference with astronomical observations. Uh, for example, uh, they're about to launch a telescope in 2025 a space telescope, obviously. And among the many things it'll be able to do, it will be able to detect the presence of uh, what we call either brown dwarfs or, or rogue planets. These would be basically planets that don't have a sun. They just formed maybe the, 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 the nebula that formed uh, our solar system for many planets that didn't have a, a sun. And they're essentially just dark, rocky bodies floating through space. And there may be trillions and trillions of them. We just don't know. This uh, satellite's going to do that by measuring the incredibly minute gravitational uh, lensing that'll happen when one of these bodies passes in front of a star. And any kind of, uh, anything that's in the way of that in front of it is gonna upset that. And, and that's just one of many examples. So that's the annoying part. So that the launch, uh, ostensibly, Bill, and not to drill down too far on this, but won't, uh, wouldn't that telescope uh, be in space beyond the low Earth orbit of most satellites? Yes, it would be, but but I'm using it as an example only because of the precision required by that particular instrument. To be to to put it as boldly and as bluntly as I can, all of the easy stuff has been discovered, um, and and as we become more and more advanced, as our sensors become more advanced, our technology, our, our computing power, and everything, we are now starting to get down to the granularity that is so fine that the presence of anything like this in terms of their their physical presence, their radio. Uh, communications disturbing exceedingly, exceedingly delicate instrumentation. So I just use that as an example. That's the, that's the annoying uh, problem. The, the catastrophic problem is something that um, I think I've heard most often referred to as the cascade. And the cascade works like this. Uh, two satellites collide in orbit. It's happened twice, I think. Uh, space is big, satellites are small, but they are moving very, very, very fast relative to each other. And if two satellites collide, they can produce a debris field. And then this debris field acts like a shotgun blast. And then that piece of debris will hit another satellite, which will then explode and create more debris, which will hit more satellites. And back when I was a boy, uh, and they were trying to explain how a fission reaction worked, the way they did it was they had an enormous open room full of mouse traps 
cocked mouse traps, and each one had a ping pong ball on it. And they threw one ping pong ball into the room, and it set off the one mouse trap, and then all the other ones set off. And it's, it's, it's great. It's a great experiment. And the problem with the cascade is, if you have one collision in space in the wrong orbit, it will put up enough debris to practically ensure another collision, which will ensure another collision, and, and in very short order, and I mean in, the, in a matter of hours or days at the most, space becomes uninhabitable for thousands of years. And when I say uninhabitable, I mean you can't get there from here. The entire Earth will have a ring of, of small or relatively small particles of, of metal in, um, and it will not be able, you won't be able to traverse it. You simply won't. It will es essentially keep humans on Earth for, for the rest of time. That's not a trivial problem. And we've been able to navigate it so far because we've had, uh, believe it or not, extraordinary uh, surface-based radars, primarily through the United States and NORAD, that are able to track things the size of like bolts you know, nutheads. 10 centimeters um, is what I saw from the European Space Agency. They actually count things floating around the planet that are 10 centimeters. I think we could probably do better than that in a push. But in any event, yes. And so there are hundreds, well, I, I guess there must be millions now, um, of, of objects that are that are tracked. And that and the good thing about, about, um, about space, especially outer space, is that the physics are relatively clean. In other words, once you know what the orbit of, a, of an object is, you can, with computers, have a very high uh, degree of accuracy. Uh, know where all of these things are going to be. So it's like the world's most, it's like the world's most complex and nightmarish air traffic control problem. An air traffic controller at uh, at LAX, for example, on a busy day, he might have three or thirty or forty planes in his sector that he might have to uh, separate on and off. But we're now talking about hundreds of thousands, if not millions, of objects that all have to be predicted for things like the space station where there looks like there's a collision that is going to be imminent, they've, they've been able to actually move the station. They can just slow it down just a little bit or speed it up just a little bit and evade that particular piece of debris. But we're still talking about essentially satellites themselves, the boosters that put them up there, the fairings sometimes of the rocket that come off, and all this space junk is up there. And right now the space junk is an issue, but if, if the space junk has one serious collision, in the in in an uh, an important orbit, that's really the end of it. And and this is one of those things, Scott, like <clears throat> like an EMP attack or, or global pandemic of of high lethality or that kind of thing, that everybody knows about and that nobody's doing anything about. And it is in the nature of humans to to behave this way. Well, you but, would think, Bill, that, I mean, obviously, for those of science-minded people watching this show, beyond the obvious risk to Sandra Bullock and George Clooney, it's just um, gonna say, I yeah. think we've, we all are horrified at that prospect. But beyond that, even Elon Musk himself must be highly attuned to this problem because they've launched some 98 rockets so far, and they hope to launch a lot more. Well, now we talk about the most important aspect of this equation, and that is manageable risk and and the evaluation of risk and reward. We've already talked about the reward being high. The question is, how high is the risk? Um, the, the satellites that uh, Musk is orbiting are really very small. Like you said, it can get 40 or 60 of them off in a single launch. So they're microsatellites, basically. And and space is big, and, they, and, and Musk's satellites do not have to be in precisely the same orbit. They don't have to be on exactly the same line. I don't know the orbital mechanics of, of Musk's system, but I'm sure there's a significant amount of variation in there that still allows them to function. The problem with, um, with doing this, there's a safe way to do this, uh, and we've been doing it for a long time, and, and the safe way is through geostationary satellites. They go up, I want to say it's 24,600 miles, something like that. But there's a point in orbit where the orbit is far enough from the Earth so that as the, as the object orbits the Earth, the Earth rotates. And so it has a 24-hour orbit. The Earth rotates in 24 hours. Arthur C. Clarke came up with this idea. And so at a, at a geostationary orbit, the satellite always remains directly above the same spot on the Earth. And that's just swell. And we have a lot of satellites in geostationary orbit, which is way, way out there, 
much bigger orbits. And essentially, since they're not moving relative to each other, there's essentially zero chance of collision. So unlike but, as a previous generation of Americans would have seen Sputnik flying across the sky, most of these satellites are not flying across the sky. They're not moving at all. And because the and because geostationary orbit is so far out, it's, I want to say it's 24, 25,000 miles high. Uh, Sputnik, which is you know, this big, was visible because it's in low Earth orbit, and that's probably 100 miles, 120 miles high. So when you get a satellite that's essentially maybe the size of a small car, you put it 25,000 miles out there, you're not going to see it under any circumstances. But because, because it is so far away, the orbit is so much bigger, there's no relative motion, nothing coming in and out of that orbit. Geostationary satellites are, are, are essentially perfectly safe in regard to Cascade, but the problem is, is that pokey, nasty, slow, slow poke speed of light. It takes about a um, tenth of a second, twenty. Fifteenth of a second. So you're jacking up the latency uh, up on an down. internet signal. Correct, and this may, and to give you an idea of where the technology of our society is, this is something that blew my mind. There are companies out there that speculate on the stock market, and they obviously do this with computers and. And there have been companies that have moved their offices, sometimes like a mile or two, because the physical distance, it takes an electronic signal traveling at the speed of light to go from this internet hub to that office is significant in terms of how fast these computers make decisions to sell stocks ahead of other computers that are trying to do the same thing. That's, that's how important latency can be in, in the world today. So with a, with a, you know, the pr probably a little less than a half a second up and down time to a geostationary satellite. That's not a problem if you're on a cell phone in the in the middle of the Amazon. But when you're dealing with the kind of latency that you need with the internet, especially with things like gaming and so on, then that's a that's a game killer uh, and, and a deal killer. So so what Musk is doing is he's putting satellites low enough so that the latency time up and down is is essentially zero and. And there's nothing that can be done about this one. This one is the laws of physics. Uh, 186,262 miles a second. It's not just a good idea. It's the law. And you cannot get around the speed of light. So if you're going to have high, if you're going to have low latency, high speed internet, those satellites have to be close as possible because the speed of light is, is entering into this, believe it or not. And that means you need to be in, in, in low earth orbit. I don't know where I just don't know the answer to where Musk has put these satellites. I, I want to say it's generally lower than um, what we would consider to be low Earth orbit, probably around 120 miles or so, where most of the orbital, manned orbital stuff is. But the cascade is real, and everybody knows about it. And on some level, it's just a matter of time. So one of the things that is, is becoming an issue, and, and the question will be, Scott, much like with a pandemic or an EMP attack or any of these other catastrophes that are waiting to happen, will we do something about it before it happens or will we do something or, or, or will we cry after the fact that we didn't? And the first thing that needs to be done is we need to come up with a reliable way of clearing space of junk, not just junk satellites. Those are relatively easy to track. Dead satellites, dead boosters, they're pretty big and we can predict those. But there's so much stuff from, from things like gloves, that they're orbiting gloves, that, that have come out of the cargo bay of something. There are there are nuts and bolts. Somebody is working on the Hubble Space Telescope, and they accidentally lose a you know a, 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 a bolt. And guess what? Well, That's before a we make now. a call to one eight hundred got space junk, uh, let's finish up with this aspect of uh, the question, uh, and that is that the federal government is running a contest uh, called the Rural Digital Opportunity Fund. It's a sixteen billion dollar prize, so to speak, or contract rather, um, that's up for grabs. And in order for SpaceX or Starlink rather to get this contract to provide gigabit Ethernet, uh, I'm sorry, gigabit e. <laughs> Yeah, that's run cables. Internet. Uh, internet speed to rural areas with less than 100 milliseconds of latency. They're competing with Comcast and their terrestrial network of towers and cords and all that kind of stuff. And right. so they've got to beat them that. So there's one aspect. There's a $16 billion prize there. But even bigger, they, the projection is that if Starlink internet customers pay 80 bucks a month and Elon Musk gets 
five million of them around the world. And, um, and he thinks that by the time they get to about 800 satellites in orbit, which they're close to now, uh, that they'll have moderate coverage in most areas. Um, already beta testers are saying they're getting 11 to 60 megabits per second uh, on the download and five to 18 up. Not to give our viewers a blizzard of technical knowledge, but the prize there is $4.6 billion of revenue per year for Starlink. Uh, that, that kind of stuff may blind a man to the hazards. It may. Um, uh, people who, who two centuries ago determined that uh, sailing across the Atlantic Ocean uh, at relatively low price were aware of the risk of icebergs as well. But they did yeah, it the anyway. The iceberg wasn't going to hit the entire population of the country that he left. <laughs> Small consolation if you happen to be on board the Titanic, but nevertheless, um, the, when I talk about the risk and the reward, see, this is the reason about that Elon Musk is such an exceptional individual. First of all, he understands that anything that's that's going to be that he, anything that he or anyone else does has to be economically viable, or else it's just a one-off. It's a it's a trip. We go there, we plant the flag, we come home, and we sit for fifty years. So it's got to be it's got to be profitable. It's got to be economically sustainable and viable. But when I talk about the the reward, as we were talking about this, I realized that, that I, I have no doubt he has the vision for this. If I do, I'm sure he does. It's not just a question of whether and and. I'm not trying to be um, flip or sarcastic or pejorative with this term, but just play with me on this. It's not just a question of whether a farmer can get high speed internet. Comcast would have to run a line, a physical line out to every single farmhouse in the country, and that is not economically feasible for them to do. Once you pay the cost of getting those satellites up there, anybody on planet Earth in the Amazon or Antarctica anywhere has access to this high speed internet. But here's, what's, here's the big, big vision. We do this show in Los Angeles, and we could do this show anywhere where there's decent internet speeds. Don't have to be super high speed, just decent. But if you think about it, if you can generate high speed internet over any aspect of the earth, any place, any location on the earth, what Elon Musk is doing, whether he knows it or not, I suspect he does know it, is he is basically saying he is laying the fundamental foundation for the entire information age to move out of cities. It's just that simple. And when I say cities, I mean any kind of population density. If you can have high-speed internet in the middle of the plains of Kansas, then there's no reason why you would be living in Los Angeles to do any kind of production because everything is delivered by the internet, uh, cooperational work and, and, and teamwork's all done on the internet. If you can have the same speed in Kansas or Antarctica or, or Montana, as you can in LA or, or, or even places like Boise or something, then you have decentralized the entire population of an information age society. And that is a vision that is, that is inevitable, I think. And you've also uh, disrupted a lot. Even communities like you know Chattanooga, Tennessee, spent a lot of money to get gigabit Ethernet avail to make that available to businesses in the area as a recruiting and economic development tool. And you completely disrupt that whole Process. Well, you do, in the, and you, you disrupt it in the same way that cable TV is essentially uh, a historical, cable TV is going to be looked back as a historical footnote between the era of broadcast television and then internet-based uh, TV. Cable TV will have been something that lasted for 30 or 40 years, and then, you know, then the, the real stuff took over. But, but what that does, just think it, just think about it for a second. If you are able to run any business, any information age business, our business, media business, financial business, any business, then you are able to essentially explode the cities. Scott and I, for those of you watching, we, we talk to each other at least, well, seven, eight, 10 times a, a, a week. We do 20 shows a week together, Scott and I. And I, I know I'm better than anybody else in the world, which is just pretty much true. You're the only person I talk to pretty much every day other than my wife. And we have met in person probably four times, four or five times together total, three times maybe with Steve as well. And that's because we teleconference every morning to get these shows out. When you can take the entire population of, 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 the, of the entire country and not only move them out of New York and LA, but move them out of places like Chattanooga. The, the house that I rent in Los Angeles would cost me 
5% of what I'm paying now if I were to look for that same house in, in the lowest real estate market in America. And if I could do the work I'm doing now from there, I would do it. And, and this is great news for conservatives because what Musk is doing is he is allowing the decentralization of cities and it is the centralization, the population centers of cities which allow the Democrats to continue to be in this game. Their entire model is predicated on large numbers of people in a small place where they can control them, where they can regulate them and do the, the, the mass transit and all the rest. If you can get people back out into the country in the information age, this country looks an awful lot more like the agrarian nation it was when it started and an awful lot less like the industrialized nation that it became when the progressive era began in the early 1900s and you had all these horrible amendments like the 16th Amendment, 17th and, and so on. So it is not just a financial opportunity, it is a way to remake society. And for those people who think, oh, this is kind of scary, it's nothing but good news for people like us to decentralize the population base of America and make people be able to have to know their neighbors again and be responsible to their neighbors and 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 have an individual identity rather than just be, you know, the great unwashed masses of the hive-like cities of the future. Thomas Jefferson, ping your office. Uh, the members at BillWhittle.com have made this program possible. We're grateful for their contributions as well as the member-operated uh, content machine known as the member blog at BillWhittle.com. You can learn more about that by becoming a member. Go to BillWhittle.com, click that big green Become a Member button. For Bill Whittle, I'm Scott Ott. Thanks for watching.